few years ago, I was a regular visitor to a company in Cluj. And I used to come and do various workshops and training sessions and talks. And I was obviously known in the company because I'd been coming on a regular basis. And people used to come in and apologize because they were two minutes late. And I found out afterwards that I was the only one for whom this was done. That normally people show up 5, 10, 15 minutes late, but because it was me and they know that I am an unpleasant, angry little man, they all showed up on time just for me. Um, so I'm hesitating now. The door's still open, but I'm going to start talking. First of all, apology. I have got a cold. Um, I got a sore throat. I am going to get through this talk, whether it kills me or not. If I do start a coughing fit, I will try to hit the mute button on the microphone before I cough. But if I don't, please forgive me. Whoever is using this headset afterwards, you're going to curse me in a couple of days, but that's okay. Um, this is not reacting. Why are you not reacting? come down here and hit that one. Will that do it? No, nothing is reacting. My screen has gone to sleep. There we are. Got it. Blah, 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 sponsors. Great job. Thanks a lot. Um, oops, there we are. This is the ninth IT camp, and I believe it is the seventh time that I am here. I have to check. It might be six, might be seven. And I just love coming back to this conference. One of the very first times I spoke, and I was reminding Andy about this yesterday, was in this room. And for some bizarre reason, the room was full. Andy Cross was speaking in the room next door. His room was largely empty. And then the hotel staff did something horrible. They went into his room and said, I'm sorry, we need more chairs next door, and removed chairs from his empty room and added them to mine. Uh, Andy remembers this. You're not in the room, are you, Andy? Not yet. OK. So why do I keep on coming back here? Why do I keep on coming back to Cluj? Why do I keep on coming back to this conference? There, there are a number of reasons. First of all, it's a great conference. OK, Mihai, uh, Tudi, yes, Tudi's there too. Great, great job, guys, great team. Somehow you managed to make the conference professional and relaxed at the same time, OK? Stacy was just saying how little you have censored his talk compared to other people. Um, he said some very offensive things, but they were offensive to himself, so that's okay. As long as he was the only one offended by what he said, we don't, we don't mind. But it's, it's a great conference. It's a lot of fun. I enjoy coming back here. Uh, the second reason I enjoy coming here is because of you guys. There is something, and I'm not going to say about Romania. I'm happy to say about Transylvania, certainly about Cluj. Th there's something about you guys. You, you come here, I've got a um, room full of young, and a few less young, dynamic people who are interested, who want to learn, who want to do something, who want to change it. And, uh, I've really taken you guys to heart, okay? Um, I've, I've said nasty things about Romania in the past. I have talked about how um, one of the causes of Brexit 
is that the British government is jealous that you're even more corrupt than they are. Um, I have to say, I, I'm going to say some nice things about Romania and the Romanian government now, okay? Be prepared. There is an official chart of corruption that gets published every year. It gives a map of the level of corruption in different countries. Romania is less corrupt than all the countries with whom you share a frontier. That's something to be proud of. Of course, countries you share a frontier with are maybe not the ideal choice. But anyway, I've taken, I've taken a liking to you guys. Um, I, I am concerned, which is why I proposed, and it has been accepted, to have a round table uh, at the end of today on the future of IT in Romania. It is time to do something, and I've been saying it's time to do something for some time. Today I'm going to suggest something you could do. Okay? I am going to sell you a free tool. It's completely free. You just have to sit here and listen to me for a while and then download the thing. Third reason I come here. Come on. You can do this. What's happening here? Okay. The third reason that I keep on coming here is because you've got some great companies here. You've got some great businesses. I'm not just talking about the sponsors. I'm going to come back to this later. But you've got great businesses. You have got businesses that are worth supporting. Um, my laptop keeps on freezing up when I try to change slides. Don't blame me. It's a Microsoft laptop. <laughs> what I want to talk to you about today. Come on. Ah. Ooh, reaction. I want to talk to you about managing skills. Within the software industry, we have taken over a bad habit from manufacturing. So if you are working in a factory and somebody's missing, I can put another person there to keep screwing that same bolt and it will work. Within software, we are not just bodies. I cannot replace one individual with another individual because you are knowledge workers. And as knowledge workers, you are coming with a unique set of skills, competencies, aptitudes. Um, and we have to measure the skill level of people rather than measuring the bodies. If you are skilled, I don't care that you are male, female, I don't care that you are white, black, yellow, green, I don't care that you are tall, short, fat, slim, gay, straight, none of my business. What interests me are the skills, special skills, something, that unique combination that you are bringing. So, coming back to Cluj, you have been a very successful town. Um, the numbers I heard were approximately, uh, what was it, 5% of everyone in Cluj works in the IT industry. That's one person in 20. That's a little bit enormous. Um, a few years ago, I came across the number, and I don't know if that's still accurate or not, that there were 850 different IT companies in Cluj. Maybe it's gone up, maybe it's gone down, I don't know. I, I, hmm? 1300. What, 1,300? 1,300, well, okay. 1,300 IT companies. 
the mic cut off there for the swear word. Um, 1,300 IT companies include. I, I don't know. I don't know where Cyprian gets these numbers from. Maybe he's just pulled them out of his ass, but that's okay. Uh, it's a good number. It's a very successful town, and you are at risk of killing the goose that lays the golden eggs. Okay, I don't know. Uh, is this known expression, known story in Romania? Yes, everybody knows about this. If there's anything you don't understand in what I'm saying, just say so, I'll ignore you. Um, there are 420,000 people in Cluj, apparently. 20,000 students. These were the numbers that Cluj is advertising, okay? I, I've got the reference somewhere where I got this from, but these are the numbers that I found. That's a young, dynamic, energetic. People are learning, people are doing stuff. Students are, are, are wonderful. I love being in student towns. I love being, I particularly like being in Cluj because students are dynamic, are doing stuff. There's always life going on. I've got walk through the streets and I see all these bright young people, the smartest people in the country who are there, who are learning stuff. I was uh, a couple of weeks ago at the university in Timisoara, um, which was basically the same amount of students. And I can tell you that the students in Cluj are much better dressed than the ones in Timisoara, okay? Ripped jeans, no, that's over, okay? Ripped jeans was fashionable 10 years ago. Stop it, dress properly. Um, I'm finding in Cluj mainly two industries, within the IT industry, I mean. I'm finding two types of companies. There are loads of small startup companies, and there are a few large multinational development centers. And so the question is why? Let's start with the multinational development center. Here are some companies that have got IT in Cluj. Um, I picked some large companies that had an office in Cluj, that had IT development in Cluj. Uh, I threw in the top layer of sponsors because I'm trying to be politically correct. I didn't throw in all the other sponsors. My apologies. If you're not paying for platinum sponsorship, you don't get on my slide. <laughs> Why are they coming here? What is the number one reason for a multinational to send their IT development to Cluj. You guys are cheap, okay? The average employee in Romania earns 50% less than an average employee in Western Europe. An average employee in Romania earns 50% less than in Western Europe. That's quite a shocking number. I must admit that when I take a taxi here and I hand over a fistful of lay, and then I have a look how much this actually cost, I'm always shocked at how cheap things are here. But that's in balance. People come to Romania because the average employee earns 50% less. According to the statistics you can't see down here on the right, I've looked this all up, I've checked it again yesterday to make sure that I had up-to-date numbers. Um, you can't read the references, but that's okay. And then we've got the startup companies. The startup company, small company, I'm going to build up, I'm going to start developing software. So why are there so many startup companies? Why are there so many people 
trying to build a business in IT and in software development. Come on, the first time you said cheap labor, what is attracting so many people to software development? Expensive labor. The average salary for an entry-level software engineer in Romania is 25% higher than the average salary in Romania. Again, I checked these numbers yesterday. You can find all this on the internet. If you... But I was actually, I was going to say, if you can find your way through all the different porn sites, but that seems to be getting better now. And it's, it's, it's less a gener generic porn site, and it's starting to actually, or maybe it's just I'm getting old. A um, bit of both. Entry-level software engineer earns on average 25% more than an average employee. And this is made more interesting because you've got so many companies, according to the number that Cyprian just invented, 1,300 companies. So it's very easy for me to cross the street and earn more money. I can just go because, you see, the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. The grass is always greener somewhere else. This company, ah, pff, I know everything that's going wrong. Once I go over there, that's a great company to work for. Okay? By the way, the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence is true on both sides of the fence. The main reason the grass is greener on the other side of the fence is because you haven't been taking care of your lawn. Cut the grass, water it, and get green grass on your side. It's Sunday, when are you going to cut the grass? Okay, inside joke for those who were here in the previous session. Um, <laughs> it's very easy to switch over. It's very easy to go there. Once you're there, you'll find out what's wrong in that company. I'm going to uh, throw up something a little bit strange here. But I'll explain it first. You create your little startup company. You start doing stuff. You start growing. You start growing. You start hiring more people. And your company runs into trouble. Does anybody here know about the chaos theory? Mm. Oh, there's a couple at the back there. Well done. I am going to use a very simple chaos formula here, which is this one. Y equals R to the power of x minus x squared. And I'm going to circulate through this by changing the value of R. The value of R is in the bottom right-hand corner. I'm doing these calculations. I'm looping on it. And I'm just seeing that as I start hiring more people, we're still good. Things are progressing. The company's growing. I've got more people. It's all under control. That's fine. And then there comes a point where something bizarre happens, which should be any moment now. You see, at the far left of the line, there's a split. I've suddenly got two types of projects here that are running that I have to manage simultaneously. But that's OK. We're still under control. I can still bring it through. And it looks like it's getting bigger because things are getting more complex. I have to start managing. I've now got things that are really breaking up into two categories. I've got small projects, big projects. I've got people that are doing what they're told. 
but I've still got it relatively well under control. And as the company continues to grow, I find this is getting more and more difficult to manage. And things start happening, bizarre things that I don't quite understand. And as we grow, it gets more and more complex. And my little entrepreneur who created the little company suddenly finds he's head of this mess. And he doesn't know what to do about it. And things are getting completely out of hand. And then, suddenly, this happens. And I realize I am in deep doo-doo. How do I get out of this? How do I move to the next level? How do I solve this problem? That's what I would like to talk to you about. When you switch companies, when you go across the road, you take your little backpack, cross the road, to create your new business, to join this new business. You're pushing up the cost of software, obviously, because you're going to be earning more money. At the same time, you're pushing down the value of software because you're leaving behind the experience that you were doing very well and you got to start again with new culture, new organization. It starts right at the beginning when you go for a job interview and things don't quite work out. We hire people because they are competent, because they are knowledgeable, because they are bringing skills that I want in my business. That's why I'm hiring you. Um, and then I'm going to ask the same question as was asked just now. How many people here have got a micromanaging supervisor, team leader, project manager, general manager? How many people here have got a supervisor who is micromanaging them but don't want to say so because he might be in the room? <laughs> um, There comes a time, I hire people, I've chosen you. You've come along, you've seen what I'm looking for, you've come to an interview, you've gone through all this. I have decided I want to hire you. You have sold yourself to me. Just out of curiosity, how many people here have got a job description that corresponds to what they are doing and what was promised when they were hired. Three, four, okay. It's surprising. I was talking to someone yesterday. Is it yesterday? Sometime recently. Not yesterday, no, early, anyway, in the past few days. They said, I got hired because they needed .NET developers. And I went for the job interview because they needed .NET developers, and I came as a .NET developer, and then they said, oh, but before that, you've got some Java work to do. And so did some Java work, and then after a year saying, when am I getting the .NET stuff that I actually want to do? And the answer is, well, you know, you've become so indispensable and knowledgeable in Java, we don't want to let you go. Right? You hire people for a reason. You have to respect them. People we hire, when they come on board, don't fit into the culture. This is one of the risks and try to impose experience, knowledge, and competency. Oh, wait, this was the best practice in my previous job. This is the way we should be doing it. I don't care what your standards and policies say. I have been doing this for the last 20 years, 10 years, three years, two months, whatever. 
And that was recognized as best practice in my previous job. So therefore, that's the way we should be doing. You left your fucking previous job. You didn't like it there. Don't bring over your best practices from the place you didn't like working. Hiring process, I want to find the best people. I have often said, and I will repeat it, good management is hiring competent people and trusting them to do the work correctly. Good leadership is hiring people that are smarter than I am and motivating them to lead the business, okay? If I'm hiring people, it is because I trust you, because you've got knowledge, because you've got skills, because you've got potential, whatever it is. Unless you are a junior, new starter, an intern, whatever you want to call them, I don't need to micromanage you, but I need to give you the structure in which to work. I got hired for the job. I got hired because I've got experience and skills and knowledge. And now I've got some, uh, let's say, some bodily orifice who is out there busy telling me what to do day by day and managing, micromanaging me. When we hire for some, for when I want to hire someone, I'm advertising skills. I'm looking for someone who's got good knowledge, who can do this, who has got experience. Um, a lot of the hiring process sometimes falls into la la land, where I'm suddenly looking for uh, someone who's got a minimum of 10 years experience as a skilled high-level architect, but is less than 25 years old. Um, we know that, okay, but I'm advertising skills, I'm advertising function, I'm advertising responsibility. This is who I want to hire. This is the person that I'm looking for. And so, I put out an, an ad, this is a job ad. I'm not going to go into the details of it. I was going to originally, but I thought it's going to demoralize you. Um, it was job ad, and what do I do? As someone seeking a job, and I'm sure you know about these things, they are books, they are consultants, they are websites, that tell you how to structure your CV, your resume, that tell you how to act during an interview, that tell you how to dress, that tell you how to lie. Okay? Suddenly gone from, I want to go for this company because I have got skills and competency, to I am going to go and present myself at this company and pretend I've got skills and competency so that they will take me on you're both going to regret it. I've used this triangle many times before and I'm trying to figure out why the hell I left it in this presentation. But okay, I'll go through it. Um, basis to produce quality, and I always come back to quality because it's the only thing I can talk about is the combination of people, tools, and process. The combination of people and tools, those are your resources, that's what's available to you. The combination of people and process is the efficiency of the work you are doing, and tools and process rest on the work you have to do. The pink triangle in the middle here gives me your ability as a business, and then I can draw a vertical line that defines the quality of my product. The quality of my product is dependent on getting the right balance, on getting the tools and the process that support the people and encourage them. Now, 
for some reason, I'm going to decide to increase the workload. Because, remember my chaos slides? Company is growing. It's very hard to say no to a new client. Okay? If you, if you want a room in a hotel, and they've got 100 rooms in the hotel, and the 100 rooms are rented out, the hotel manager is going to say, sorry, but you can go to our competitor down the road. They've got very nice places too. If I have got a hundred work hours available within my company, within my software company, and a nice big client comes along and says, can you do this as well? I'll say, yes, sure. Somehow, we'll find it. We'll magic it away. I'm keeping the same level of resources and efficiency in my work. Therefore, I am reducing the quality of what I'm delivering. This is a problem. If by accepting more work, I am reducing quality, I am reducing the reliability and the interest in my company, I am impacting the business as a whole. And this is important because each and every one of you comes with a background. You come with a whole history. You are the result of your experience, of your education, of your DNA, of every book you have ever read, of every exam you have taken, of every film you have seen, of every piece of music you have listened to, all that has combined to make you this unique person that somehow doesn't just fit into the slot I want in my business. So, how do we put it together? Little Lego blocks, okay? What I'm going to do, excuse me. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the building blocks because I'm really not interested in your past. I'm interested in what you can do for my business. And what you can do for my business is this unique combination of skills that you're bringing and putting at my disposal. That's what interests me. And the approach I'm going to suggest has been catching on internationally. I have uh, been seeing more and more job adverts that are advertising requested skills according to Sophia. Sophia is a way of understanding who should be doing what. It's free to use, always good to know. Um, it supports skills and competency within the IT industry. SOFIA SFIA stands for the Skills Framework for the Information Age. It is built by people like you who volunteer their time in order to correct and improve it on a continuous basis. It started off about 30 years ago. Um, it got taken over as a standard. It has been growing. It has become an international standard. It is in negotiations right now with a number of different um, standard organizations in order to make it happen. It's simple. It is telling you what is a skill. It is telling you what is your level of competency in a skill. And it allows you to identify what combination of skills I need for a particular pr uh, job and what combination of skills you have as an individual. It is based on experience. So I don't care that you've studied this in university. What I'm looking for is your experience. Have you done this in real life? That's what we're looking for. You've studied the theory, good. You've never put it into practice. We have a problem. 
that's not a high level of competency, even if you got good exam results. It's independent of technology and approach. So it doesn't tell you what kind of technology, it doesn't give you a hint that you should be agile or waterfall or any other fashionable approach. It's just talking about people. It is developed by the industry. The Sophia Foundation has got one and a half employees whose main role is to coordinate the volunteers around the world who are working on this. Um, that's how I got into this because I know the, the guy in charge, the, the, the full person on the board who recruited me to translate the whole model into uh, French. Um, you've got a skill because you've got the experience in a real-world situation. It is based, first of all, on experience, and it brings together an understanding of your professional skills and your behaviors, and your knowledge, both technical tools and methodologies and so on, and incidentally, qualifications and certifications are interesting, but that's not what, what matters. It is updated, so it is the, the release 7 that we're working on was reviewed 20,000 times. 20,000 different people reviewed this in 146 countries to review, understand, and approve it. Um, proofreading, the design, the contents comes from people like you telling us why you misunderstood your, your why we misunderstood your job. It has got the number of themes that are built into it, different views of the contents so that if you are in a DevOps organization, it has recommendations as to what you should do. If you're in an agile organization, it has a different set and so on. Big data, uh, cybersecurity, continuously being updated and managed. It is international, so the original is in English. And because of the guy who runs the thing, I'm afraid it is English English and not American English. He is uh, a little bit precious about his spelling. It's been translated into Spanish, German, Chinese, Arabic, French, French Canadian, which is slightly different. Probably need an American translation one day. Italian, Polish, uh, in the process, Japanese, Portuguese, Russian, and Turkish. Okay, so it's something that has had an impact. People have used it. I volunteered to translate it so as to use it. It's being used internationally, so there are a number of standard organizations out there that are referring to it, are trying to include the structure and the contents. Uh, you can find all this out on the website. Uh, it is really a global... Am I allowed to say global? Just in case, you never know. I'll throw this one in as well, okay? Um, whatever you think the world is, we cover it. There are two main components to it. I've got a few of these posters here, which list the various skills and give some level of understanding of the various levels of responsibility attached to it. Uh, you can come and get some of those. <coughs> Sorry. There's a book which gives all the details, which I've only got my copy here, so I'm not leaving that here. Um, there's a website. You can download all this stuff at the website. It does ask you for reference. It does give you a license to use it. Um, so on the website, you've got all the information you need. 
you are required to sign up for a free license for internal company usage. If you're planning on selling it or making a living out of it, then you have to pay for a license. Okay, website gives you access to all the things, gives you a little video here, two minutes explaining what all this is. They say it in two minutes, I'm taking an hour. Um, gives you all the skills. So every skill, there are 102 skills listed. The skills have got levels of competency each time, up to seven levels of competency. So you can see here, information content publishing has got levels one through six. Uh, demand management only has five and six. That's clearly understood, it's more a specific competency. You don't want beginners at it. Um, it's there, it's free to use. The seven levels of competency that we put on the skills, level one is you're able to follow simple instructions. Level two, you can assist someone who is doing the job. Level three, you can do the job yourself. Level four, you can help someone else understand. You can enable someone, you can coach someone in it. Um, five, you can make sure it's done correctly. You can start guiding. Level six, initiate, influence. Level seven is a little bit different. Level seven, we're talking about writing the policies and the standards within your company. If you are level six in a skill, you should have covered levels one to five. Level seven, not necessarily. For each competency level, we talk about autonomy, level of autonomy, influence, complexity, knowledge, and business skills. So we're trying to make sure that you know precisely what this means. Okay, level three has got very clear explanations. These are the levels of responsibilities. They're all defined in great detail on the back side of the poster. So. We've got a few of those, you can, there's only a few, but whoever grabs them first at the end of the talk can have them. Okay, it explains, level three, apply, works on the general direction, uses discretion, uh, specific directions, accept guidance, and so on. If I look at higher level, business skills has a full range of strategic management and leadership skills, so they're various clear explanations as to what these different levels mean for different skills. And of course, the skills are clearly explained as well. So skill name here, Digital Forensics, has got an app code, which I hate, because mostly these codes don't seem to correspond to the word. I've actually got one code, and I don't remember which one it is, where the four letters of the code are not found in the name of the skill. They've managed to come up with an abbreviation that doesn't match the skill name at all. So a clear explanation as to what that means. They are grouped in order to make it easier to find, which is why the poster has got different colors on it. So I've got um, strategy and architecture things, change and transformation, uh, development and implementation, delivery and operation, and every time there are subgroups underneath that to help you identify more rapidly the skills that are useful and that you want. Where are we? I've taken an example here to clarify what we're talking about. Software developer, I'm expecting because of the theme of the conference that most of you have some understanding as to what a software developer is. Um, some of the other skills might have been more doubtful. So this is part of development and implementation. Within that, it's part of systems development. And within that, we've got a skill called programming software development. 
which is the design, creation, testing, documenting of new and amended software components from supplied specifications according with agreed development security standards and processes. That's how we define the skill. Are you able to do this? Well, level five tells me that you are identifying the local t or team standards, you're advising on the application of the standards, you've got technical responsibility, you're assigning work package, providing advice, guidance, and so on. This, for me, is the job of a senior team leader, maybe. Or maybe a technical leader. Below that, I have got level four. Designs, codes, tests, corrects, documents, complex programs with a well-engineered result, takes part in reviews of own work, and leads reviews of colleagues' work. This is your senior software engineer. At level three, this is the doing phase. I've got designs, codes, etc., moderately complex, and collaborates in reviews. This is your average developer. Level two, designs, codes, etc., simple programs. This is your junior, your intern. Okay, so I've got the different job descriptions. By understanding what is the level I need for a specific product, what is the level I have for a specific individual, I can manage this. Levels one can follow simple instructions, doesn't interest me in programming. Level six and seven doesn't interest me as a programming activity. Yes, someone has to define your policies and so on, but it's not in the scope of a software developer. Project manager, different example. Okay, uh, running a little bit short on time, so I'll go through this very quickly. So we have got for project managers not only the skills, but we've got the levels of responsibility. What's your autonomy? What's your level of influence? What is the complexity of the work you are doing as a project manager? What is the level of knowledge you should be displaying? What are the business skills that you have proven to have? Um, That's what a level four project manager should look like. This is what a level four relationship manager should look like. Project manager should be project management and relationship management because you need to work with people. One individual, one person, has a combination of skills. By using the list, you can identify what you have as skills and what is your level of competency in the skill. It's fairly straightforward. That's relatively easy to understand. This is the description of an individual. Um, probably someone who's got a little bit more than two years experience, but this is a, this is a real profile. And that's what I would expect to see, that everybody has got. Some people will only have three or four skills. Some people will have a lot. By using this, I can identify what are the skills you have. I can identify what are the skills I need within the business. I can identify who is the best person to fill a job. I can use you to your maximum potential and make sure you are happy in your environment. I can identify what are the skills I have to look for when I am hiring more people. You can identify as an individual what is your next level up. Where do you want to go? What is the training you should follow? What is the next level of exp experience you should be accumulating? By using a um, chart like this one, where I'm bringing it all together, I would expect to see movement here for each person in the company. I would expect every year to see that 
somehow, somewhere, you've gone up one level, you've acquired a new skill, things have happened. Okay, setting sun, conclusion. It's a free tool. It's there. Um, I know that one person in the room, at least, has downloaded this and implemented it. Am I allowed to say who that is, Cyprian? Okay, uh, it's him. <laughs> he just did it on his own. Uh, no consultant coming in to explain how to do it. There might be, I know there are other companies in Cluj that are using it today, uh, including some of the larger ones. It's relatively simple to use. It's relatively simple to understand. It stops you from having to reinvent a new matrix structure. And we would very much like you not only to use it, but to tell us how we need to change it next time around. So we're looking for support volunteers who would like to do it. And that is where I finish. Um, <laughs> I've still got, what? Five minutes? Five minutes. I've still got five minutes if you have got questions. I thought someone had a question at the back, but he's actually stretching. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. If we have got a hand microphone. The, the organizers of the conference, by the way, have learned to put me just before lunch it's so okay. that I finish on time because I know you're all leave to because you're hungry. But yes. Uh, so the, the question uh, is related to the time that will be spent by a person from the HR department or a manager or whatever to evaluate the uh, uh, candidate during the interview or uh, during the evaluation. Uh, uh, in, in your company annual evaluation. So how much so time will you spend? Preliminary evaluation of a new candidate. Um, I was implementing this or initiating the implementation of this uh, in one industry um, two weeks ago. And I interviewed majority of the people in the company and it took 15 to 20 minutes per interview. Just, I know, I am not interested in the skills that have got nothing to do with the job. However, by understanding what are, if I'm doing an interview of a new candidate to hire, and I have a clear understanding of what are the skills I want in that person, I can focus my interview on that, okay? And because I've got a clear understanding of the skills and the level of experience and competency I want, I can cut through the bullshit. I know you want to tell me about all the wonderful things you have done in the universe in past lives because you have to sell yourself during the job interview. But I know what I'm looking for. You have it or you don't. And we can go through that fairly quickly. And then there are the other aspects, the cultural aspects and so on, that can be added on. Does that answer your question? You should have a more structured interview going faster. Come on, anybody else? No other questions? Yes. Uh, what if, like it's, it's nice, you see, I've got the guy here holding a microphone, and it's the person closest to him who comes to ask a question. You're, you're so friendly to him. Make him run over there, come on. Uh, yes, okay. Uh, what if, let's say, for a particular job, you cannot find uh, candidates with experience? 
You just can't find them, and you're forced against your own will to hire people without experience or with let less experience. Well, how you so that? I've got my grid, which says for this job, this is what I'm looking for. I cannot find this unique combination of skills and competencies. Because I cannot find it, I might decide that I'm going to hire someone who's got some of the skills and split the job with someone else. Or I might immediately identify what is your career progression and build that into the job description from the start. Saying, okay, this is where we are, this is where you have to be within three, six months, and we got to work on that. But because you've got a clear career path, you know what the next level is, I can build that into your job from the day one from day one. So potential does actually matter a lot, not just previous experience. Oh potential matters. That's why we have got the uh level one responsibility. Level one means I can follow simple instructions. Okay, uh, y y we've all started there. Every job we've had was following simple instructions. So. Yep. <laughs> it's just the front row, you see. Uh, for already existing employees, would you recommend uh, self-evaluation or that the evaluation okay. be done by s some upper existing employees will start with a self-evaluation so so what i did uh, two weeks ago is run through a self-evaluation ask people do you do this have you done it yes or no okay is this project management yes i do but no i don't do budget okay so then we'll move down one level to a level where budget is not included in it so there is so now I expect those profiles to be reviewed and approved by the, your immediate colleagues. So line manager, immediate colleagues, yes, I think you've underestimated yourself here. I think you're overselling somewhere else. So start with a self-evaluation because I, I, I if I'm going into a company to implement this, um, I expect a full implementation for a company of, say, 100 people. I would not expect to do that in less than three weeks full time. Okay? Okay. And I'm probably too expensive for that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, I, I have a question uh, related to your uh, quality <coughs> triangle. Uh, so how uh, will you keep the quality uh, constant or m at the maximum level when you are forced to cut uh, uh, money uh, because m some big project uh, uh, okay. how was to rejected? How to maintain quality while cutting costs? Exactly. You cut costs by improving quality. Because if I can, we all make mistakes, that's a fact of life. The idea of the whole approach towards quality, continuous improvement, quality management, etc., is to find out how can I identify that mistake before it has an impact. So I'm going to increase the effort on reviews, on daily activities, so that I can save money by cutting down on testing, on maintenance, on frontline support, on service desk, and so on. Those are all the result. Those are all extremely expensive results of bad quality. So I cut costs by focusing more on the improvement. Okay, which is contrary to what most people do, unfortunately. When we talk about cutting costs, too many people are out there cutting investments. And there's no return on investment without an investment. Yes. Okay, I, I, I've got a young lady in front here telling me to shut up, go, uh, let you go. 
Um, thank you, thank you for your time. Uh, tomorrow, tonight, there is a round table that I'm participating on uh, future of software in Romania. Uh, feedback form, blah, 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 lunch over there, you know it, well, actually over there, right, good luck. <laughs>